There is no doubt, and there is plenty that has been said and talked about Sardar Patel, about his great contribution, about his unifying the country. But on top of it, he was a great visionary. He was a visionary who in his time could think beyond his time that what all could go wrong if he does not take those steps which he did. Probably within his own lifetime it would not have mattered. If India's sovereignty was not established throughout its length and breadth, but beyond his time they might have been a source of a great national degradation. He brought this country together. When we envision the future, actually there are two components involved in that. The dream of the future. One is that you look into the time span ahead of you, based on an empirical knowledge or experience of the past. You think not only about your generation, but the generations that are going to succeed. And then you also have a direction to that vision. Without a direction, probably a vision doesn't mean anything. So in the nation building, the function of vision is very important. It is just like the role of a radar in any missile or in any super aircraft that we use today. And this visionary or this vision is not something which stops with a man or which stops with a generation. It has got to be a continuing thing. A nation which aspires to be great, we want everyone there to have a vision. And that makes the larger national vision. I do not know how many, how many of you would be able to recall what China looked like in late 70s. It was much backward than India. It hardly had any defense industries. It had a very low technological base. It's, uh, we had a setback in 62, but that notwithstanding, India was much ahead of it. But then there was a man, Deng Xiaoping, who came out with a vision. And a vision up to 2050. And in that vision, he said that, well, how China has to emerge as a major power of the world. What all it should do, that by 2010, it is able to become the major economy of the world. What it should be do that is able to become the industrial power by, about, uh, by, the, by the end of uh, last century. How is it able to become a major military power by 2020? Why it should avoid all mili major military conflicts up to 2050? It has to become the world global leader. Now that was the vision which changed China. Today, the world is excited about India. One question is, of course, asked the time. Will India make it or still lose the opportunity? Because they thought that such turning points came in India's long journey, many entire mood of euphoria. Why the world is so much upbeat? Of course, one of our biggest strengths is our stable, democratic, constitutional quality. Our open, pluralistic society governed by the rule of law. But what has added more to that is our emerging as the fastest growing major economy. Our demography, our youth bulge, India is going to continue to remain the youngest nation of the world till, 19, till 2065. So we've got a long time when the world will be having its major workforce and the youth power coming from this country. But the most important thing has been the dynamic leadership that Indian polity has been able to throw up. A government which had come with an absolute majority and has been able to change the course of its growth and development. The world view that by 2030, India will be the third, third largest economy is not disputed anymore. That it will be an economy 11 trillion plus. It will be the third power after US and China. It will also have a military power, which probably will be one of the most uh, capable military power to able to, which would be able to bring about the stability, not only in the region, but beyond. It's also felt that its technological prowess would be something that would be able to contribute substantially in the new and the niche areas of technology, may it be space, may it be cyber, may it be nanotechnologies, may it be more advanced technologies. But are Indians also as much excited about it? Do you see the mood? I was just trying to see that how many of the articles have been written about what India would look like in 2030. 
and I found that most of it is from the foreign origin. Some of them have copied, cut and paste here, doing a very poor job of it, but no original thinking has taken place in India. We don't have the mindset where we think long term, strategic. Probably we lack confidence. We think that it's all very uncertain. It's all gas. It doesn't happen. And I was trying wondering why is it? Why is this mindset of the Indians? And one of the explanations was this, that it is the inertia of the long years of slavery, bondage, subjugation. You live in the present. You live for today. Survival is my problem. Will I exist? And therefore, to me, something which is too remote is something very fearful, something very apprehensive. I am not too confident whether I will be able to do that. Let me take care of my today. Probably tomorrow will take care of itself. So one is that, the historical friction. The another the explanation was this, that Indians are very individualistic. That is psychological reason. That psychologically you think about yourself. And vision always includes something which is collective. Something that you think beyond your own self. You think about your neighbor, you think about the street, you think about your um, country, you think about your community, you think about the society. And you say that, well, I've got hardly time, resources and capabilities to look and take care of my own self, well, who cares for the rest? So, an individualistic mindset, where even if you want to get moksha, you want to go to institute and become a hermitage and go to the Himalayas, you would like to get the, sub, the uh, sublimation all by your own self. It is not collective. You would not like to go for the collective praying, you would not like to go for war collectively. And that's what probably Sikhism brought to us, when Guru Gobind Singh realized it. That you have to eat together, that if you want to fight together, you have to eat together, you have to pray together, you have to live together. But probably there is another one, you know, that's more painful. And that was I was reading. Mr. I.G. Patel talked about it, something. He says Indians don't dream. He says the politicians are responsible for it. He says they built up so many dreams, and those dreams never came true. So they have refused to believe those dreams. They tell you about a good tomorrow to get the vote today. And that tomorrow never comes. Is it true? Let us be very objective about it. Let us not all be so self replicating Do you know, in 1945, when India's population was about 32 crore, and we had the whole of Punjab, which later became the West Pakistan, and the whole of Bangladesh, which that time was East, uh, was, uh, East uh, Bengal, and the population was 32 crore. And these were the two areas which were the granaries of India, one growing with the wheat, another the rice. And there was a famine. And do you know how many people died in that famine? Five lakh people died in that famine. I wonder how many people in this room knows, know it. Nobody talked about it. Five lakh. They could not be dug, nor could be burnt. The Indian army was called by the Britishers to, to dig the trenches and put the bodies in that. Probably the sad chapter of history is even forgotten even by the countrymen. Today we are 130 crore people. There is no more of the Punjab left, no more of the Bengal left. Today we are not, not, not that every Indian has got plenty of food, we have got plenty to export, we find that our additional export, uh, our additional production clears the glut in the market. The land has squeezed. You think the Indians have done nothing? Don't you think that we can be proud of it? Probably in the last 70 years we have progressed the way more than one. We had, most of the countries would have done for centuries. We are in cyber, we are in space, we are in technology, we have got the best institutions and we have got the best in human resource capital that we have built. So let us not be self-deprecating and just because some of your dreams don't come true, don't stop dreaming. And I as a security man considered it extremely important. Because when your dream starts coming true or when you, when you stop dreaming, your will gets eroded. And when the nation's will gets eroded, it can never become a power. No army can fight whose will has been destroyed. Wars are fought not to kill. People are not the killers. Wars are fought to kill the will of the nation against whom we are fighting. So that it can accept to the peace terms which are acceptable to us. We, we destroy the will of the nation, will of the people, will of that nation. And if we ourselves are going to destroy the will of the nation through our negativism and cynicism, well, probably we'll have a very little future. And that is the painful thing. That the, that the countrymen themselves do not feel. 
upbeat about the future of India that the world is talking about. They do not realize their own strength. We can never be great unless our society and our people think that it is, it is, it is within us. We are capable of doing and achieving that. You know, coming back to my subject, that what are the pitfalls? What are the possible minefield that we should avoid? The first thing, avoid anything, counter anything, fight anything that erodes the national will. Build the will of the nation and this will, this nation will get built itself. There are plenty of forces, more within than outside, who probably are bent upon eroding the will of the nation. We are very fortunate. But then last four, year, uh, four years or so, the country's national will has been initiated that has been taken and successfully been this thing. Yes, all these new experimentations, reforms and others are exothermic exercises. They create heat, they generate heat, so they create pain. No country can become big or great without experiencing some pain. We have to make some sacrifices for the coming generations. Don't forget that our past generations, who probably never lived to see the fruits of independence and the freedom, probably had made many sacrifices. Is it something that we cannot do in case there are certain hardships? These are the hardships that will ensure that your children and your grandchildren tomorrow will be able to live and breathe in a world, in a country, where, in a world where India is much more respected, India is much more powerful, India has got a much greater destiny. I think if somebody asks me what is the greatest contribution or what is the greatest achievement of India in the last few years, I will say that India has started realizing its strength, realizing its might. And that has started building up its national will. And this national will is reflected when we are able to take strong positions both within and outside the country. When we are able to follow our independent foreign policies which are in the best interest of our country. Even when it comes to the major power relationships. We are here to serve the Indian interests and we can do it with confidence. But it requires the national will and will of the people. So I think the first pitfall that we have got to avoid is that we should not allow this national will to get here today. But there are some other reasons also why I decided to talk on this. And that's what I was telling Mr. Surya Prakashji yesterday. One reason.